Okay, <clears throat> let's get started with uh, the final exam uh, ideas and approaches. And we'll start right off at the beginning here. Tension in a string with linear density of some such is uh, 0.4 Newtons. What's the wavelength of sinusoidal well, sorry, wave driven at 100 hertz on this string? Okay, so we want wavelength, we're given frequency. <clears throat> we want the wavelength and we're given a linear density of this, that's mu, we're given uh, 0.4 Newtons, that's tension. <clears throat> and so this looks like <clears throat> we can use again this V equals lambda F that we always keep uh, coming up with, and that tells us that uh, V is equal to, I mean, uh, so wait a we want uh, the, what is the wavelength? We want the wavelength. So lambda, then we divide both sides by F is V over F. V is the square root of T over mu. And so uh, it's now becomes a simple plug-in problem. T is here, mu is there. So you divide that, you get to move it over by, it's like 400 squared is 20, divided by 100 is uh, 0.2 meters. Uh, and 0.2 meters is uh, 20 uh, centimeters. And so that's this one. <clears throat> okay, a man driving his car while texting. Uh-oh, that looks sound very good. Uh, sees the light is red, slams in the brakes. His car slows down to the constant acceleration. Okay, so we're thinking kinematics. Uh, how far does the car go before stopping? Okay, that sounds like a delta X. That's what we want. <clears throat> we might as well write down the others. Uh, v naught is equal to this, 21 meters per second. <clears throat> v is equal to, uh, let's see, so the car slows. Uh, how far to stops? V is zero meters per second. <clears throat> Constant acceleration is five slows with constant acceleration. So the slows means it's a minus five meters per second squared and T, we don't know. <clears throat> so uh, the minus sign here comes from the slows. Uh, actually the T is something we don't care about. <clears throat> so we look for the equation without T And that's the one that says uh, 2a delta x is equal to v squared minus v naught squared. And so delta x then is equal to uh, v squared minus v naught squared. So minus 21 squared meters squared per second squared divided by 2 times uh, minus 5 meters per second squared, the second squares in the bottom is canceled on one of the meters, you get meters. And so two times 0.5, uh, two times five here, or two times minus five, the minus is canceled. That's 10 on the bottom. So we have uh, 2.1 times 21. And that gives us this answer right here. 2.1 times 21 is around 44. <clears throat> Next one, so 44 meters is, is quite a ways, right? <clears throat> uh, not too far, but that's a pretty tough acceleration. <clears throat> Five meters per second squared is about half G. So that's a hard braking there, and you still go 44 meters, which is a fair ways down the street. Okay, so object making simple harmonic motion with an amplitude A, is this, this is the amplitude, takes 0.2 seconds to travel from one point with zero velocity, next point of zero velocity, 
I remember that one period goes from potential energy to kinetic energy going in one direction uh, to uh, potential energy going to kinetic energy in the other direction and then you go back around to potential energy again. So there's one, two, three, four arrows. <clears throat> so uh, 0.5 seconds to travel from one point with zero velocity to the next point of zero velocity. Well, zero velocity is here. Uh, B equals zero, B equals zero. So this time here, time given is T over two, half period. So period is equal to one second. Uh, and that's what we're after. We're after the period of oscillation. Look, there we got it. <clears throat> so the amplitude given here, we didn't actually have to use. We just had to know that it, uh, it's half a period to go from V equals zero to V equals zero, not a whole period. A planet has diameter twice as large as Earth and mass eight times Earth. What is G? The value of the gravitational acceleration on the surface this planet has compared to G Earth. Okay, do you remember this? The easiest way to do this is to remember the force due to big G, which is G, uh, mass of the planet, mass of the object, over r squared and this part is equal to little g. So little g earth is equal to g mass of the earth over radius of the earth squared. Okay and little g of the planet p is equal to get diameter twice as large as the Earth, and the mass is eight times the Earth. So it's G times eight times the mass of the Earth over twice the radius of the Earth squared, which is eight over four, because right, two squared is four, times uh, G Earth, which is twice G Earth. All right, I just took this, this, and that part there to get G Earth. And what's left is the eight and the two squared, which is the four. And so that looks like then our answer is C. And we go on to five. A collision, oh, that's pretty obvious between the two unequal magnitude. Um, so collision tells us immediately that momentum is conserved. Uh, <clears throat> each impulse is spread to a larger mass. Uh, impulse is smaller. Impulse is imported to the larger mass by the smaller mass. Which statement below is correctly? Okay, so this is the two impulses. Now, what do we know <clears throat> about? Um, we know momentum is conserved, and we also know. So you notice how you get an impulse here, right? What is impulse equal to? Impulse is equal to change in momentum, but it's also equal to F average times delta T. And so if we do I on smaller it equals to F on smaller delta T and I on larger it's equal to F on larger delta T. Well, the delta T's here, they're the same. Since it's the same collision. And these are the same. Since uh, Newton's number three. Uh, 
<clears throat> and so uh, the answer then uh, had better be they're the same, right? That's the same, that's the same, and these therefore are the same. <clears throat> okay, so tube with a certain length is closed at one end. Assuming the speed of sound is a certain number, what's the fundamental frequency of air in this tube? So we've got a uh, tube that's like that, uh, open, closed, gonna have something that looks like this in here. <clears throat> but we don't really need to know that because we can look it up. Um, if you go to your um, uh, list of handy dandy formulas for resonance, uh, you find that, um, uh, where's my handy dandy formula for resonance? <clears throat> uh, if for the case of the open closed tube, you have the frequency open close frequency of the nth one is equal to uh, n times v over 4l uh, with n odd. And this 4 here, and the fact that it's odd, that's for the open closed case. So, uh, we're looking for the fundamental, n equals one. Uh, there's the length, L, there's V. So, okay, that's everything. You plug it in. And when you plug it in, you'll find the answer is this. Toy rocket is shot straight up using a spring. Rockets initially pressed down so that the spring is compressed by nine centimeters. If the spring constant is this and the mass is that, how high will the rocket go? Neglect the effects of air resistance. So here we have an initial and we have a final. And we're talking about a spring. And those things together kind of all point to uh, energy. So let's write down energy. Work non conserving is equal to delta Ke plus delta Pe. Well, <clears throat> the Pe goes down by mgh. So uh, we call this y equals zero, y equals h. Uh, potential energy, sorry, goes up by this amount. So y final minus y initial uh, PE of gravity is uh, mgy. So it's mgh minus zero. Delta PE is mgh, plus on it. Delta KE, um, that's the gravity. I should say. What's kinetic energy? Well, it starts pressed down and released. So Ke initial, and it gets to how high? Well, it stops the top. So this is the release and stops at top. Ke final is equal to zero. Okay, delta Ke is zero. And we say, okay, well, what's going on here? Uh, we need something else. And of course, that's delta Pe of the spring. And Pe of the spring, initial is one half K x squared, Pe spring 
final is zero. And so what you get, and this is zero because you're neglecting air resistance. And if we combine this all together, we get zero is equal to plus MGH minus, because that's initial, minus uh, plus zero minus one half KX squared. Okay, we solve this for H, move that to the other side, divide both sides by MG. H is equal to uh, KX squared over 2MG. Okay, we've got X. You know, that's X. That's uh, K. 50 grams, that's M. We're gonna to have to convert it to units. G is our friend, we know that, so we have everything over here. So this amounts to plugging in for number seven, and you get the, see? <clears throat> Block on a frictionless surface, it's connected to 3.2 kilogram mass right there hanging by means of a light wire that passes over the top. Find the magnitude of the acceleration of the two blocks. This is frictionless. Um, this is, so uh, let's call this one M1 is seven kilograms. M2 is equal to 3.2 kilograms. And we've got to do two sets of uh, equations. The forces on this one are weight, normal force, tension. So in the x-direction, you just have tension. So it says the tension is equal to mAx. This one over here, you've got tension going up you've got um, weight going down, you've got the acceleration going down, a y is negative. And so if this is accelerating over here, it's positive because that's uh, plus x. This is equal to minus a because it's going down and y goes up. <laughs> And so in the y direction over here, this is the second mass. This is the first mass over here. So that's m1, that's m1 times a. a is, they share the same acceleration, right? a over here is a over there. They're equal because of the rule of the rope. Magnitude of the tensions are equal to also and so I'll just call that T and okay the y dimension oh for the mass second mass uh, becomes equal to T is up minus W two G is equal to uh, minus m to a. We have two equations and two unknowns. We have this one and we have this one. We want the accelerations, so I'm going to solve this for t. It's already solved for t. So if I plug this one into this one uh, for the t, I get m1a, that's in for t, minus m2g, if I move this to the other side, plus m2a is equal to zero. Move this back to the other side, m1 plus m2, and those two terms times a is equal to m2g. This kind of makes sense. <clears throat> m2g is what's pulling it down. It's accelerating both of them. So that makes sense, A is equal to M2 over M1 plus M2 times G. 
Uh, no, it's a matter of just putting in the numbers. I got 3.2 in the top, uh, 10.2 in the bottom. So about one third of that should be around a third of the 9.8. If you actually put it into your calculator and work out the answer, it's this one. And on to the next one. Distance from the Earth to Sun is known as one astronomical unit, AU. It's also equal to that big number in meters. Neptune has an orbit with an average diameter of that. What is the distance from the Sun to Neptune in astronomical units? This turns out to be a dimension problem. Uh, and so we need a unit multiplier. We get it from this thing. One astronomical unit is equal to 1.496 E11 meters. And so now we want to change this into AU. And so we do that by writing it down, 8.80 uh, E. Now this is kilometers, I want meters. So I'm gonna change it now, that'll be 10 to the 12 meters. Now I wanna get rid of meters, so I wanna divide both sides by this. And so I multiply this by one uh, astronomical unit divided by 1.496 E11 meters. Okay, the meters will cancel out. My answer is going to be an AU. And this is eight by 10 to 12 over 10 to 11. So it's like 88 over 1.4. <clears throat> And if you take 88 and divide it by 1.4, you get around 30, right? Because 30, well, it's close to one, it's closer to one and a half. So if you take 30 and take um, uh, uh, one and a half of it, you should get pretty close to that. Um, two, 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 two. Oh, yes. Aha. Hmm. This is the tricky part. Under didn't look quite right. <clears throat> this is what? This is equal to the diameter. And so the radius is equal to the distance of Sun to Neptune is equal to the diameter over two, which is now equal to basically 88 divided by 1.496 times one half AU. And now it's 44 divided by one and a half. And one and a half times 30 is the 45. So uh, this is gonna be the closest. And that's actually what you get if you use um, your calculator. Number 10. A bucket of water is swung in a vertical plane of a circle, 0.85 meters. So it's going around here. That's R. R is equal to 0 0.85 meters. Notice we get the radius this time. We're not going to uh, worry about what it was last time. What is the minimum speed that will just prevent the water from falling out of the bucket when it's upside down, the top of the circle? And so here is where we're interested in. There's the water in the bottom of the bucket. And if we draw a free body diagram or a force diagram of the water, okay, the water becomes a dot. Put our forces on it. Uh, the uh, weight is down, no force is down. Everything is down. So is the acceleration, a centripetal. So we uh, <clears throat> might as well call down up, right? Y 
x, then they're all positive, and we get um, n plus w is equal to m a c. <clears throat> the um, minimum speed will be when n is equal to zero. And so then we have just uh, uh, mg of zero plus mg is equal to m v squared over r. And look at that, the masses cancel out nicely. And we get uh, v is equal to the square root of g times r. And so g is about 10. This is 0.85. The square root of that's going to be just a net there under 3. And that gives us this answer when we plug in. So <clears throat> notice, by the way, here is that it's at an instant, right? At the top of the circle, one place. Or instant. That's our hint that it's Newton's second law. What else works at an instant? There's no initial or no final. And so if it's in motion, okay, that's about what you get to do. This block sliding down, though, has a clear initial and final. And so don't expect Newton's law here. It's got a frictionless track. That's a keyword. Uh, starts at the top, uh, quarter, quarter of a circle at radius 10 meters. So it's a quarter, that means this is 10 meters down here. From there, which means, of course, that that's the height it went down. <laughs> Uh, given initial downward velocity of this, so it's not zero, it's moving. What is velocity at the bottom of the track? And this rotational energy is negligible. Okay, so it's talking about energy here. We're talking about speeds. And it's frictionless. That says energy methods has initial final has energy written all over it, <clears throat> and so we start the energy methods then as we always do. Work non-conserving is delta k e plus delta p e. Uh, this is zero. That's because it's frictionless. Delta Ke is one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared, and it's lost potential energy, and so it's minus mgh. And if you look here, hmm, this happens whenever you have just kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, uh, and and no friction. If you had friction, this wouldn't work. But in these cases, the mass ends up dropping off because this is divide mass out of zero. Zero times mass is still zero. And uh, let's see, what are we looking for? We're looking for V final. So we multiply by two, move these over to the other side. Uh, v final squared is equal to uh, V initial squared plus 2GH. So, <clears throat> Uh, if we take the square root of this, we've got our answer. We've got the initial squared. That's right here. We've got uh, G and H. H is our 10 meters. Uh, <clears throat> G is our friend. So you go ahead and you uh, plug into this and you get 17.5. Um, uh, it's not simply a matter of adding to the velocity. It adds in squares. Well, this adds to the square to give you a square. 
And so it's, uh, but you know, it's going to go up <clears throat> it goes, uh, speeds up. And if it was started from rest, GH here, uh, it's about 10 times 10. So you're going to get about 14, um, for, uh, uh, well, 10 times 10 times two. So that's 200 square root of 200 is somewhere around 14. And so um, you'd be getting 14 over here if this was zero. With that being 10, it adds square. You don't get quite as much. That's a reasonable value to go up. <laughs> um, certainly not going to get that big. And it's certainly going to be bigger. So that's really the only choice you've got <laughs> for reasonableness. Energy required to compress the spring three centimeters is two joules. How much additional energy is required to compress it an additional three centimeters? So the total is six. <clears throat> so, okay. So we want to know uh, delta potential energy from for the spring from uh, uh, three, well, x equals three initial to x final equals six centimeters. <clears throat> okay, and so why don't we do this in meters? So this is one half k x. Uh, final squared minus one half k x initial squared for this initial and final. Now uh, we need k, and so this initial stuff up here that's going to tell us uh, get k from here, and so over here. Uh, this is from zero to three, x equals zero to three. There's no potential energy here. And here it's just uh, one half k, um, uh, three centimeters is 0 0.03 squared uh, meters squared. That's equal to two joules. And so K then is equal to uh, you multiply by two, four divided by 0 0.03 squared. Uh, and that's in units of joules per meter squared. So um, that's Newton's per meter. Because a joule time a newton times a meter is a joule, so get rid of one of them that way. Leave the other one there because newtons per meter looks good. So that's some number k. We take this number for k. We plug it in for k. We plug in x final, x initial. Um, x initial goes in there, and that means we have everything on the right side, and that means it's now a plug-in problem. It becomes a little bit more boring and the answer to that once you finish with your calculator should be six joules. And you might say it took me two joules to go the first amount and I go the same amount more it's up to six and the answer is well you end enough um, uh, Ending off here at um, um, twice as far in, and so you should get uh, four times, right? Twice as far. So four times the energy. This is from zero, and so that would be eight joules 
but then you have to subtract off the first two and so you get the six joules so if you understood this that's a shortcut you say okay well if it's twice as much it's four times as much energy because it goes to x squared so it's eight joules to go from zero to six but we have to subtract off now the zero to three because we only wanted the additional from three to six and that's gonna eight minus two is six that's our six so you could have just reasoned your way through in a few seconds but i don't think too many of you would want to do it that way so we do it out in steps and you see how it works uh, high jump athlete leaves the ground lifts their center of mass 1.8 meters and crosses the bar with the horizontal velocity 1.4 meters per second what minimum speed must we leave the ground to accomplish this air resistance is neglected um, we're talking about speed we're talking about changing height so change height <clears throat> in other words delta pe uh, we want a speed and this is making us think of the word energy so let's try it <clears throat> work non conserving is equal to delta ke plus delta pe uh, air resistance may be neglected so that is equal to zero uh, delta ke is uh, the final one is one half this is our uh, crossing the bar with horizontal velocity this the minimum speed would be to have zero vertical velocity so minimum at zero vertical velocity and so that's then the final that's at the top half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared so this one we have uh, this one we want and then uh, just going up by um, potential energy is increasing by m g h h is the 1.8 g is our friend and there's no mass anywhere but if you look at this again no friction this is zero mass is cancelled out everywhere this moves over to the other side the minus becomes a plus so v initial squared is equal to uh, v final squared I'm multiplying by two here so it's going to be plus two gh and uh, <clears throat> it becomes a plug-in problem again and when you plug it in you find that you get um let's see this is number 13 you're going to get this one right here <clears throat> and does this make sense okay you're going six meters per second <clears throat> uh and 1.4 at the top so yes you had to be going faster down at the bottom is enough to get you up by 1.8 meters well there's that g in front of the h that brings that up to sort of an 18 and that's of course you get the v squared and plug into calculus say yes that's what it has to be uniform hoop solid disk in a sphere are each same mass and radius radius rolling down without slipping and uh same speed on a horizontal surface. Surface they're rolling on then begins to angle upwards. Uh, which of the three objects rolls the least distance up the inclined plane, still assuming that the objects don't slip? <laughs> so, uh, so they're rolling on a horizontal surface and then they go up. Uh, so they're rolling like this 
and they go up to where they stop. So <clears throat> there's a delta PE here. Center mass goes up by H, right? <clears throat> and we want to know which has the uh, the least distance up, to, so that we want the smallest H. Okay, so let's um, think about this. There's a change in energy, right? Delta PE. Um, there's rolling without slipping. So this is again an energy problem. Work non conserving is equal to delta Ke. Let's put in the translation plus delta Ke. Rotation plus. Um, Delta PE gravity. And if we're starting at a certain speed over here, then uh, the, um, well, it ends up with zero, right? So we get a, a minus one half m v initial squared minus one half i omega squared. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and then the delta PE is going up. And so uh, final is more than initial, Y is bigger, so this is a plus uh, MGH. We can do a little work on this. We can use omega here is uh, V uh, over R. And we use this as um, Well, I is going to be something times mR squared. So we could call it a constant times mR squared, where that constant there depends on the shape. And we're gonna see which one we want. <clears throat> uh, the m's then drop out and we end up with uh, uh, h or gh doesn't really matter too much, is equal to um, uh, move these two to the other side. You get a half m, uh, so it's a half times, okay, we divided the, uh, the m out of everything. So and that's v, the same v as this one, because uh, that's omega initial. Uh, the R squared's cancel, the M we came out, it's another half on that, so it's just this constant. And this one is just a one plus constant times uh, the initial squared. <clears throat> so the initial squared is the same for all. G is the same for all. Half is the same for all. One is the same for all. So the one with the smallest c gives you the uh, smallest h. In other words, the ones with the bigger moment of inertia have more energy over here. Bigger i, more kinetic energy. Here, Ke has all gone into potential energy. And so more Ke means more potential energy means goes higher. So you want the smallest i, which is the smallest coefficient out in front in an i. <clears throat> and so which has the smallest i of everything that we have here? The answer is the sphere has the smallest i because that's C is two fifths. Right, solid disk is C is a half. Um, do, 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 do. The hoop is C is equal to one. And so two fifths is the smallest. Now on the test, you'll be given the moments of inertia. In fact, you are, right? There they are. Um, C is one, C is a half, C is two fifths. Two fifths is the smallest. Because it's the least you're going at rolling at a certain speed, you have the least energy 
in a solid sphere compared to a hoop or a solid disc. The most energy is actually in the hoop because you have the biggest eye. If you're going that fast, you already got that. Now, usually thinking the race down the ramp, well, they have the same PE there. Here you get more PE if you go on the same speed with a bigger moment of inertia. So it's not quite the same as the race. You really have to think it out again separately. Okay, 15. Hydraulic jack. It's got a beam on it. <clears throat> and diameter small piston is 0 0.05, big pin is 0 0.3. How much force do we have to apply to the small piston to support the beam, which weighs 2,000 newtons? Okay, this sounds like hydraulics. Based on delta P is the same everywhere. And that's Pascal's principle. And so this is based on pressure is equal to force per area. And so let's do it at two places. Over here, uh, force small is equal to uh, pressure uh, times the area, the small. Uh, and over here, remember the pressure which is really a little delta P. It's going to be the same on both sides. So the little delta P we had to do there is the same over here as the force of the big one is equal to uh, uh, delta P times the area of the big one. And the area of the big one is equal to, um, uh, so the delta P's are the same. Uh, so we can write uh, force of the small over area of the small is equal to force of the big over area of the big. We want the force of the small, small area over big area times the force of the big. And then we'd want to use a bunch of pi r squareds, pi r small squared over pi r big squared, force the big, which is the 2,000 newtons. And now it's plug-in problem, right? And so you take, um, plug this in and you end up with this right here. And that's, uh, let me just, so that's our plug-in hydraulics problem and we move on to 16. Uh, crate, it's a horizontal, uh, has a horizontal eight newtons force applied to it, like so. And coefficient static connection friction are these. What is the magnitude of the acceleration of the crate? <clears throat> and so I guess initially we have to say, does it move? And the answer to the does it move is um, first found by doing the um, um, doing the <clears throat> uh, uh, friction. So we test static. So if we draw the free body diagram, we've got the force applied. We've got static that way. We've got um, the normal force going up and we've got mg going down. Uh, if we write our chart, force x, y, we got the four forces. F is all in x. Um, the uh, normal force is all in y. The weight is all in negative y. And the static friction is uh, in negative x. And if it's static, these have to sum to zero. Uh, F net x equals max equals zero. If it's static, 
and the same over here. So this tells us that um, this one tells us uh, n equals mg. This one tells us that um, f is equal to fs is equal to uh, was less than equal to um, uh, usmg. And so is this true? A newtons, is it less than or equal to? Um, US is 0.3, M is 3, G is 9.8 meters per second squared. And so that's about 30 times 0.3, and 30 times 0.3 is, um, uh, bigger than this, so yes, it's true. And so that means static works. And if static works, static it stays, no acceleration. Now, what if it, if this wasn't true, we said no and had to write an X here, then we have to redo this thing with kinetic friction, where we write mu k times n here, uh, this is the few cases where n is mg, as it's horizontal force, flat surface. And then we'd run through and we'd calculate out what it was. And since mu k is less than mu s, it's going to move. A girl throws a rock 10 meters per second from the top of a building 22 feet up. Assuming free fall conditions, and the ground is horizontal, how far from the base of the building will the rock hit the ground? Okay, this is projectile motion. And we know how to do those. We know delta x, v naught x, vx, ax is equal to zero. Delta y, v naught y, vy, ay is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second squared and time is shared between the two of them and so if we look at what we've got in here thrown horizontally 10 meters per second v naught x is 10 meters per second and horizontal v naught y is zero meters per second uh, and then uh, 22 meters above street level so delta y is going to be minus 22 meters uh, we want to know how far horizontally we want this one. And there's only one thing you can't get over here. So uh, if we ignore the Vy, we can get T, T from Y uh, without V. And so that's from delta Y is equal to V not y t uh, plus one half a y t squared. That's going to get us delta y. V not y, that's going to get us t. Uh, v not y is zero, so this term goes away. And so our t is going to equal to the square root of two times delta y divided by uh, a y, which is g. Uh, delta y is negative, a y is negative, so don't worry about a negative in the square root. And then we plug the t in here. Okay, now we have the t. Again, we don't want this vx, so we use the same equation. Delta x is equal to um, uh, v naught x t plus zero, because a x is zero. <clears throat> and so plug this t into there, solve and you'll get an answer which turns out to be 21 meters. So you plug this into so for the t, v naught y comes down and you end up with that one over there. <clears throat> Just to get the rough numbers right, it's 22 times two is 44 divided by about 10 is about 4.4. That's a little bit more than two. Plug two times the 
uh, 10, you get about 20, and so that's ballpark, right? A block is attached to a spring, doing simple harmonic motion with this. X is meters, T is seconds, the spring constant is this. What is the mass of the block? Hmm. Well, we're telling spring constant, we want the mass, uh, that 50 then is omega. And omega we know is the square root of k over m. And so uh, we can uh, solve for m, right? So if you square this, omega squared is k over m. m is equal to k divided by omega squared, which is our 100 newtons per meter. Uh, divided by uh, 2,500 uh, 1 over second squareds. <clears throat> and so if you uh, think of this Newton as a kilogram meter per second squared, the 1 over second squareds cancel out, the meter cancels out, get kilograms. And so you get uh, 1 25th of a kilogram, and 1 25th of a kilogram is 40 grams. So this is 125th of a kilogram. <clears throat> okay, next one. Car travels 40 meters per second with a tire radius of this. Tires roll without slipping. What is the angular speed of the tires about their axle? Angular speed is omega. That is equal to V tangential over r and v tangential is equal to v of the uh, center mass for roll without slipping which is what we have here and so this then is another relatively simple plug-in uh, 40 meters per second over 0.3 meters, you're going to get it one over seconds. Radian comes in uh, because um, <clears throat> that's the non unit, right? So if you take 40 and divide by 0.3, then you're going to get 133 radians per second. And you might look and say, uh, well, how do it's not this one? And a revolution is a unit. You can't just stick a unit on here. A radian is a non-unit. And so what I'm calculating here is in radians per second is a non-unit. Uh, number 20, got a record turntable. Moment of inertia about its axis. If I not, initially it's at rest. Uh, three spinning records and falls to stick to it. <clears throat> uh, each record has a moment of inertia I1, where it's a quarter I naught. And there are, how many? Three. Uh, and each has initial angular momentum of omega naught. What is the angular speed of the turntable and three records after they stick together? <clears throat> Okay, so this is a rotational collision. So uh, L initial is equal to L final. And L, of course, is I omega, I1 omega 1 plus I, well, let's do I naught omega naught plus I1, well, let's put it just to 3. There are 3 I1 omega ones and that be able equal to um i naught plus three i one times omega final omega naught turns out to be oh i see let's call this omega one uh yeah it goes with one we'll call it one 
you can fix your problems like that if you want to. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is zero. And so we have uh, that. And so we have um, omega final is equal to uh, divide both sides by this, 3i1 over i0 plus i plus the 3i1s again times uh, omega 1. And i1 is a quarter i0. So it's 3 quarters i0 over i0 plus 3 quarters i0. <clears throat> omega 1, the i0s drop out. And you end off with 3 quarters on the top and 1 and 3 quarters on the bottom, right? 1 and 3 quarters is 7 quarters omega 1. So that's 3 sevenths of omega 1. Uh, and so uh, 3 sevenths is then our answer, right? The, these come out and bang. Uh, because I changed all those to ones, because <clears throat> I wanted to. Uh, 21, soccer ball is launched 40 meters per second, 53 degrees above horizontal. And what do we want? Velocity at the highest point of its trajectory. What do we know about the highest point of its trajectory? The velocity. We know that at the highest point, vy is equal to zero, vx is equal to v not x, since ax equals zero. <clears throat> and so if you find v not x, that's the velocity at the highest point, and it's going to be in the x direction. So the vertical had better be zero at the highest point, right? That's what this means. So it's one of these two, forget those. What is the horizontal? <clears throat> well, let's figure it out. Here's our initial velocity. It's 40 meters per second. It's got an X part and it's got a Y part and it's got a 53 degrees there. And we want V naught X. V naught X is equal to 40 meters per second times it's the adjacent, so it's cosine. 53 degrees. So I use degrees mode on the calculator. Uh, as you're doing this, you wouldn't want to use the other mode, but if you use degrees mode, then you find it's uh, 24 meters per second. And since Vx is equal to that, it means that is our answer. It's not this with that. That's probably what you get for V naught. And that's not what is the highest point. So it was beginning with. And we crossed all those out anyway, because it has to be no vertical there. A boxcar rolls in couples to. It sticks perfectly inelastic collision. So that means P initial is equal to P final. <clears throat> it rolls into one another. After the collision, what's the speed of the two cars? Okay, so momentum conservation is M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial is equal to M1 plus M2 V final because it's perfectly inelastic, they couple. And let's take this as 1, 1, 2. That means this one is 0 and you end up with 12 
thousand kilograms times five meters per second is equal to, well, V final, we'll just divide by the sum of the masses down here. 12,000 plus 9,000 kilograms. So it's gonna go slower than five meters per second. Well, they're all slower, uh, but 12 over um, 21 times five, and that gives you um, this one right here. Plug it into your calculator. So momentum conservation. Uniform meter stick is supported at the 25 centimeter mark. And that means that uh, this is halfway. So another 25 centimeters to where the weight goes down. <clears throat> and this equilibrium means torque net equals zero. Alpha equals zero. Uh, when that's supported at the zero over here. So what's the mass of the meter stick? Well, they're both at 90 degrees. So torque one kilogram equals torque center mass. Uh, 25 centimeters, uh, one kilogram times G, uh, times sine of 90 degrees is equal to 25 centimeters uh, mg sine of 90 degrees. So the sines of 90 degrees are both one, the g's both cancel out, the 25 centimeters both cancel out. And you left on this side with an m, and this side with one kilogram. And so for our answer, we get one kilogram. <clears throat> and that's, you kind of notice when it's the same distance and they're balancing and it's at the same angle. Okay, yeah, it's gonna have the same mass. Same lever arm as they say. Loudspeaker in air generates sound waves at kilohertz. Some of these sound waves enter a pool of water where the speed of sound is faster. What's the wavelength and sound in the water? Okay, well, what changes? As you enter the water, the medium, so the speed, the V changes. Yeah, they told us that. <clears throat> Uh, but the frequency does not. And so when we're comparing these two, we have to say, well, V uh, air is equal to lambda air frequency air and V water is equal to lambda water frequency of the water. And what we know from this is that these two are equal to each other. So we solve for that. So frequency equals frequency equals V air over lambda air equals V water over lambda water. And we want the lambda water so lambda water, you multiply both sides by it, we better flip this and multiply, it's equal to uh, V water over V air times lambda air. V is higher in the water, so the wavelength is uh, higher. And now it's just a matter of plugging in, it's 1.4 times um, the Lambda air, lambda air we can get from here. And we plug it in over here. I suppose we could have solved this by just saying, um, you know, we could just solve it by using this, right? 
um, uh, really just need this. Where that's kilohertz and that's V water, right? So, um, <clears throat> so uh, lambda water is equal then to V water over frequency, which is what you get if you solve for that air and plug it in here anyway. <clears throat> That's just the long way around. This is the short way around. And uh, 1,400 divided by 1,000 is 1 1.4. Plug in. Uh, we're working our way through this. Car moves 200 meters in the plus x, 80 in the negative x, takes 20 seconds to complete the entire trip, the average velocity of the car in the x direction over this time interval. Now it's the average velocity, not average speed. And so the average velocity is equal to delta x over delta t is x final minus x initial over delta t. x final is, uh, uh, let's say x initial moves 200 in the plus x, then 80 in the negative x. And the car takes 20. So uh, how far is it? gone. Let's draw a little picture. It goes 200 this way and then it goes 80 that way and that's x final. So x final is then uh, this much and this much is 200 minus 80 which is 120. So this is 120 uh, meters minus zero meters divided by 20 seconds. And the zeros cancel and the 12 cancels uh, to make, um, by two to make a six. And it is plus. Now if you had done the average speed, you would have said, oh, it went 280 in 20 seconds, and you get 14. Not right here. Tuna rests most of this at a depth 15 meters below the ocean surface. The absolute pressure at this depth is that. What's the volume of the fish? The atmospheric pressure at sea level is that. Okay, so uh, the rests motionless. That means that it's static. And the static word makes us think of Newton number two. And so we draw the fish. It's got a buoyancy force going up. It's got a weight going down. The Florence buoyancy is equal to rho fluid g volume of the fish. And the weight here is equal to mg. Those two have to be equal to each other. Uh, and so, uh, the um, so uh, F B minus W is equal to M A is equal to zero. So F B is equal to W. If you sort of do some uh, analysis of this, you'll say, okay, we've got um, I want the volume of the fish. Divide both sides by rho G. Mg over rho g is m over rho fluid is equal to volume of the fish. And that's 35, 350 kilograms over um, 
the um, density of the fluid is equal to, oh no, we don't have the density of fluid. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? <clears throat> we need the density of fluid. And that's where all these other numbers come from, right? So the absolute pressure of this, so now we say, okay, here's the water. Here's our fish. And we're told that pressure at this depth is this. P here is equal to that. P at the top is equal to this. Delta P it's equal to rho g h of the fluid. And so this tells us that rho fluid g h is equal to, and the h is 15 meters. G is our friend, rho fluid is what we want. This is equal to um, uh, the P low minus P top. And so this gets us, these are known. So the only thing not known is this. You get that, you plug it in here, you get the volume of the fish. So all this other information here really is just to get the density of the fluid. Then we can plug it in here well, the mass is given so you can get the volume of the fish. So all the numbers turn out to be needed. And um, once you're done and uh, plug it in, you find that's the volume of the fish. And it's just a matter of plugging in at this point, so I'm not going to bother. You get two big numbers there. <clears throat> this tends to be 150,700 uh, on this side. One 5700 because that's what you get when you subtract 101 from that. You take that and you divide it by GH, which is about 150. And so you're going to get about a thousand for that, a little bit off. It's 350 over a thousand is around 0.3. That's the closest one. Turns out to be the one you get with the calculator. <laughs> okay, cooling fan running at 900 revolutions per meter takes off makes 1500 revolutions before stopping. Average angular acceleration. Okay, so this looks like kinematics. Constant acceleration. Or constant angular acceleration. Alpha. And so we know how to do these. You write down delta theta, uh, omega naught, omega, alpha t. Okay, this is the one we want. This is 1500 revolutions. We got to convert that to radians, uh, two pi radians per revolution. So 2 pi times 1500 is delta theta. Uh, it's running at 900 revolutions per minute. And again, we've got to do 2 pi uh, radians per revolution. And we've got to do uh, 60 seconds per minute to get these uh, into the right units. Uh, so this here is uh, 3000 pi radians, because the two gives you 3000. This you divide 900 by uh, 60, that's 90 over six is 30 over two is 15 times two is 30 times pi uh, radians per second. <laughs> Omega uh, stops, zero. And so T is the one I guess we don't care about. And so we want the one without T. And that is uh, two alpha delta theta is equal to omega squared minus omega naught squared. And 
the um, we want the magnitude, so it's going to be a plus. Alpha is equal to omega squared minus omega naught squared over uh, two delta theta, and uh, now it's simply a plug-in problem again. We get omega naught, we get delta theta. This is zero, that's a minus, so this is going to be a minus, but then the magnitude so it's going to be a plus. You plug in the numbers and you end up with this one. Twenty-eight ball bearing release from rest surface of the water after falling two meter in the water. Its speed is five minutes per second. <laughs> okay, it fell, so that talks about delta potential energy. We want a speed here. These are hinting that this problem is energy. Work done by the water. Okay. Well, work non-conserving is equal to uh, <clears throat> delta Ke plus delta Pe. And now where's the work done by the water? You might say, okay, well, it could be work done by the buoyancy force, that's the water. That's not in here. No potential energy for water or buoyancy force, that must be in work non-conserving. If there's any friction, that's also in work non-conserving. So work non-conserving here has got the friction, it's got the buoyancy force, anything that the water's doing. So the work done by the water, that's over here. Uh, okay, it's released from rest. So Ke initial is equal to zero. Delta Ke is Ke final. So this is one half mv final squared. And potential energy has gone down by mgh. And it fell two meters. So h is two meters. G is our friend. M we actually need to know now, 0.25 kilograms. M we have p final, we're given. And so we have everything over here. You plug in. And what do you end up with? Um, you end up with um, this one. And you might say, is negative OK? And the answer is yes, if there's friction. And also, yes, for buoyancy. Uh, since um, F buoyancy is opposite motion. So both of them would be negative. So negative is a very good thing for it to be. 29, force pulls the basks to the left across the rough floor as it slides. The other forces are friction, normal, and weight. Which diagram best represents these forces acting on the bottom? Well, the normal is perpendicular up. The friction is opposite motion. Uh, gravitational weight is down. And the force is to the left. Okay, they all have the force to the left, right? So friction force down, I mean, uh, weight force down crosses this one out. And the rest weight force is down. Uh, opposite motion for the friction force, opposite motion, opposite motion, opposite motion. That takes these two out. And normal force has to be up. Well, that takes that one out. And there's only one left. And it's this one. The other way to do it, of course, would be just to draw the thing and say, okay, if F is this way, then friction has to be that way. Or kinetic, I guess, it moves it. Normal force has to be this way, and the weight has to be down. Just look for the picture that does that. <laughs> um, 
Number 30, elevator. Rising in its speed is increasing. Riding in its speed is increasing. So that means V is up. So if the speed is increasing, then A is uh, same direction as V. So A is also up. <clears throat> What's the tension the elevator cable pulling the elevator upwards? So here's our elevator tension, mg, acceleration. So let's write it down. In the y direction, we have uh, t minus mg is equal to ma. t is equal to mg plus ma equal to a thousand kilograms times 9.8 plus three meters per second squared. And that plus is because of this plus is because it's in the same direction, it's up. And so this is about 13 times that, just a little bit less. And so it's going to be bigger than 9.8. And that's this one. It's actually only one bigger than uh, 9.8 times 1,000. So that's the one it has to be if A is up, right? So <clears throat> T is bigger than uh, Mg equals 9,800. Newtons since acceleration is up. And there's only one of those, so we didn't even have to multiply. 31, kilogram block hangs motionless from strings. Uh, 50 gram bullet traveling horizontally strikes the block and becomes embedded inside the block. Sounds like a collision. Perfectly inelastic. Immediately after the bullet becomes embedded block, a block is observed to have a speed of this. What is the speed of the bullet before it hits the block? Well, if it's perfectly uh, elastic, we have m uh, uh, wood, mass of the wood, uh, velocity of the wood plus mass of the bullet. Velocity of the bullet is equal to the wood plus the bullet times the final. <clears throat> And we want the V uh, hangs motionless here. So this motionless tells it that this is zero. And so the bullet then is equal to mass of wood plus mass of the bullet over mass of the bullet times V final. <clears throat> There's V final. We've got the masses right there. Uh, the bullet's small compared to the wood, right? 50 gram to 1.2 kilograms. So uh, small on the bottom means that this should be much bigger than the eight meters per second. And if you go and uh, multiply it out, you get answer E, which is 200 meters per second from a plug-in. So it should be much bigger because the ratio of this to that is, well, it takes, um, to get to one kilogram, it's about 20 times bigger. And so 20 times that is about that. <clears throat> when you multiply it out, you get the number exactly. And last one, rounds a curve. With radius of this in the rail mode, what's the minimum status friction you need to keep the car from sliding off the road? <clears throat> okay, so here's the car. And it has an acceleration. Let's suppose it's going, the curve is coming towards us like this. And so this is looking inwards. We've got uh, mg down, we've got normal force up. <clears throat> Uh, we've got 
static friction going this way and we've got an acceleration which is um, going this way because we're going around the curve this way and the direction of static friction is v squared over r okay so um the force of static friction that we need that's the only force that way that's acceleration so in the x direction uh f net equals max or force static is equal to m v squared over r and force static is uh, the minimum coefficient of static friction uh, so the minimum is uh, when f static is equal to mu static times n in the y direction we learned that uh, n minus mg is equal to zero or n equal mg again not always the case but it is here it wasn't the case with the elevator for example <clears throat> and so uh, combine the two together force of static friction equal mu s uh, times n or times mg is equal to m v squared over r and so the static friction is equal to divide both sides by mg the m's cancel you get v squared over g r it now is a plug-in problem and the answer is okay v is 20 square root 400 divided by 10 is 40 divided by 100 is about 0.4 If you use your calculator, you find it's 0 0.41 because g is just a little bit less than 10, not 10, makes it just a little bit bigger. Okay, that is the end of our sample final exam. And we didn't go through all the numbers in detail, but we got to the plug-in points. I think I've pointed out to you <clears throat> most of the, how I identified which one goes with which ones as well as um, pointing out the directions to move in. And so that is all for the show. Thanks.